up with it, y'all? It's EJOE Business. Welcome to the channel. Okay. If this is your first time here, thank you for coming. I hope you enjoy my reaction. Um, I don't know why I paused, but anyways. So what we are getting up into right now is into something I've never done. I've done reactions to documentaries when I learned about um, different cities. Like I, I looked at things in South Africa. I looked at things about that, um, about little documentaries about cities and things that happened about different stories, different scenarios, and uh, a lot of that. I did like a lot of stuff in Africa because something I was really interested in. But this is something different because this is on a serial killer. Um, I guess he killed like a somebody said like he killed like 50 50 people i guess 50 people but um yeah I, all i know I, I just heard it was the the most the craziest serial killer is gonna be set on parole he's gonna be let out this year and this is august 2023 right now and they said that he's being released and He's a serial killer. He killed over 50 people. Well, he killed 50 or whatever. And he's going to be released. But I heard it's not in America. I guess it's in Ecuador where it is or Colombia. I don't know. It's not in America. Because at first I was like, come on, bro. But yeah. So this is Luis Alfredo Garbato. Gar Garbito. All right. <laughs> Let's watch this, all right? Um, I heard they call him the beast, too, whatever. So let's get up into this, all right, y'all? Um, let me know how you guys feel about this, and let's get into it. Because the case of Luis Garavito. Luis Garavito, or the beast, as he was popularly called, is perhaps one of the most prolific serial killers in America. And the fact that his victims were actually all children is quite disheartening. What would make a person want to kill over 300 kids in such a vehement manner? What? Well, you are about to find out. So I said 50 people. I just saw a highlight of 190 children. But then they said over... Okay, so I'm literally about to watch something. I just feel like this is about to be hard to watch. I ha All right, damn. I didn't. In today's video, we'll be looking at the case of Luis Garavito. The second most prolific child killer. Uh, seeing the pain and suffering of an uh, Luis Garavito. Luis Alfredo Garavito, known to the world. They enjoy uh, seeing the pain and suffering of another person, um, but the pain is really just a tool. Childhood. Garavito Luis was born on the 25th of January, 1957, to parents Rosa Cubios and Manuel Garavito, all of whom resided in Hinova, Quindio. The first of seven children, Luis was the first among his siblings to suffer at the hands of his father, Manuel. Luis described Manuel as a drunkard, a womanizer, and an abusive father and husband. It was speculated that Luis's mother, Rosa, was a local prostitute, and his father, Manuel, would often force him to watch as his mother had sex with numerous clients. What the fuck? The abuse got so bad that Manuel began to let his wife's clients sexually abuse and molest Louise, and his mother, who was constantly under the influence of drugs, could not do anything to stop the molestation of her son. Manuel would reportedly beat and torture his children with Luis recalling an incident where his father tied him to a tree and beat him until he bled. He had a fucked up childhood, I guess, and this motherfucker ended up doing... Oh, God. 
Cal. In fact, he began sleeping with Louise when the boy was only six or seven years old. Louise turned out to be a shy and reserved young boy, never speaking of in class, but always the target for bullies. Matter. He had a peculiar Here. eye defect that caused him to wear glasses, and of course, that made him more of a target for bullies in and outside of school. Constantly having to defend himself from his father and bullies, Luis developed a violent temper that would occasionally cause him to lash out in violent bursts of anger. At around age 11, Luis was forbidden by his father from attending school or having friends. Instead of learning like his mates, Luis was forced to work to make money to support the family. Obeying his father's wishes, Luis went to work at a local drugstore. Unfortunately, this didn't work out well because the store owner ended up molesting young Luis on several occasions. What the fuck? The sexual abuse didn't end there for little Luis. On the contrary, it only got worse because a little later down the line, Luis would go on to be molested by a friend of his father who burnt him with candles. What the fuck, yo? Just hearing with what he did to those kids, with how many kids he killed, and then hearing this, is this supposed to make us feel bad for him? He fucked up because you know what? As I'm listening to this, it's like I really feel bad for him. But then it's like I know what's going to end up happening. Cut him with razors and bit him violently each time. In the end, the molestation lasted from age 11 to 14. Following his experience with underage defilement, Luis soon found himself attracted to little children, so much so that he began to strip his little brothers naked and fondle them on the family farm. What? During this period, he would also be raped by a neighbor who beat him and played heterosexual pornography while sexually assaulting him. In no time, Luis became rebellious, and his sexual interests grew beyond his little siblings, so he began attempting to rape and molest little boys in his little town. But despite Luis's preference to mainly boys, his father denied the possibility of his son being gay, and this would ultimately cause the final rift between the father and son. Luis would later be kicked out of the house at 16, but not for attempting to rape little boys, but for simply being a rebellious son. His father, Manuel, found nothing wrong with his son trying to sexually assault little boys, as he felt it was his right to do so if there were no women around. Adulthood Luis went on to work at different stores as a salesboy, all while studying marketing in an attempt to get a better job. Thanks to his effort, Luis would later land a job at a company in his late teens. But even that didn't last. Due to his violent temper and frequent outbursts of anger, he would get into verbal fights with his colleagues and even clients. Sometimes things even got physical. As expected, this oh, behavior here. eventually cost Luis his job at the company, but he later found work as a street vendor. During this time, he had numerous faux relationships with different women. Luis's mental health was also in question at this stage of his life. He experienced symptoms of depression, psychosis, and paranoia, which were no doubt results of the lengthy abuses he faced during his childhood. Luis's mental illness coupled with his perverse sexual attraction to little children, led to a string of molestations that would soon ensue. Between the mid-70s and much of the 80s, Luis would sexually molest numerous children, with a large number of them being little boys. His pedophilic activities bred guilt, which worsened his depression when he attempted suicide. Following his suicide attempt, Luis spent several years in and out of mental institutions in Colombia. All right, I'm only stopping it real quick because I just said, is that him? When they were showing that security footage, I'm tripping because 
yeah, this happened like way like over 40 years ago. I see. So, yeah, obviously ain't no security footage like that. So I'm just saying that just in case some people watching this, like, hey, dumbass, this happened a long time ago. I ain't no. All right. Anyways. But as you will soon see, this did nothing to curb his sexual and mental proclivities. Murders. Beginning in his early 20s, Luis would not only molest little children, but he would graduate to torturing them using the same heinous methods his abusers had used on him. He would normally write down the child's name in a ledger he kept and proceeded to pray for them before beginning to torture and rape them. Regardless of his reverence for the Bible and Christianity, Luis began to study Satanism and tarot reading. During the course of his study, he frequently visited psychics and cult practitioners. He also became intrigued by Adolf Hitler and began reading his biography. Intrigue became idolization with Luis, stating that he liked the ideas of concentration camps and mass graves. By the early 90s, Luis was a prolific pedophile and child molester who no longer had empathy for his victims. He was effectively feeling no guilt for his crimes. At this point, the urge to finally kill his victims was all he could think about, and he proceeded to act on this impulse. In October of 1992, Luis was out drinking at a bar when he spotted a 13-year-old boy, Juan Carlos, across the street, and he confessed to feeling a strong need to kill that day. Luis walked up to the boy, offering him work in exchange for 500 pesos, but not before he had bought a butcher knife and rope. The boy agreed to the proposed job offer and followed Luis till they were well out of the crowded city streets. Needless to say, Juan Carlos would later be discovered dead with several cuts to his body, his front teeth smashed in, and various signs of rape. Moving on to his next victim, Luis crossed state lines to visit his sister Esther and ended up killing 12-year-old John Alexander on his way there. This trend of raping and murdering little boys escalated horrifically, with each murder being more brutal than the last. With Colombia in the midst of war and civil unrest, countless children were left orphaned and homeless. These children were left to fend for themselves on the street, and they had to make ends meet by begging and completing odd jobs. With this many children on the streets, Luis's killings went practically unnoticed as no one particularly paid any attention to a bunch of missing homeless kids. Uh... Luis would lure them in with promises of sweets, money, food, and sometimes promises of odd jobs for which they would get paid afterward. Luis mainly targeted boys between 6 to 13 years of age. He would typically select his victims in broad daylight by sitting near schools and playgrounds, lying in wait for unsuspecting kids. Luis was so invested in his rape and murder rampage that he often used different disguises to ensure that no one recognized and identified him. He would approach kids as a farmer, a priest, a drug dealer, or a street vendor. After successfully coaxing a child to go with him, he would engage them in conversation along the way to wear them out and make them tired, too tired to resist the bondage he was about to put them in. Upon reaching his desired destination, Luis would attack the child, binding their hands and feet together with rope. He would then proceed to strip them naked, after which he would subject each boy to prolonged torture and rape. He would repeatedly stab the boy's hands, feet, and buttocks with a screwdriver. He would often insert sharp, pointy objects into the child's anus and even knock out their front teeth. But it didn't end there. Luis would also mutilate his victims while they were still alive by cutting off their penis and testicles. He would then insert these body parts into the victim's mouth. You should also remember that the kids were also brutally raped while being violently beaten with their body parts cut off or intestines sprawling out on the ground. This is... I did not know. I 
I did not know I was getting into this right here. Motherfuckers are so sick, man. I cannot believe this guy is still alive. After this is done, I'm going to... Luis would only climax after he had cut off the victim's head or slit their throat, a behavior he attributed to a pact he made with Satan. His perverse behavior did not end after the victim was dead, as he would often continue to molest the corpse of the deceased victims. Investigation and Arrest Throughout the early 90s, scores of boys were disappearing all over Colombia, most of whom were between the ages of 3 to 13. The disappearances had initially gone unnoticed for years because there were no official missing persons reports filed on their behalf. And seeing how many of them were homeless or orphaned, it was easy to see why. It wasn't until 1997, when a mass grave containing over 40 children was discovered, that the Colombian authorities took the disappearances seriously. The mass graves called for a nationwide manhunt for what was thought to be a gang of killers because of the horrific and brutal natures of the murders was thought to be done by cults or international child traffickers. In February of 1999, the bodies of three naked children were discovered on a burning sugarcane field with the murder weapon on site as well. The bodies were tied up and had cuts on the hands, feet, and genitals, including signs of penetration using a sharp object. It turned out that Luis had passed out after he committed the murders with a cigarette still in his mouth, which caused the field to catch fire. Trying to escape from being burnt alive, he left behind his glasses, shoes, underwear, and a receipt containing an address. The police were able to deduce from his shoes and glasses that he was 163 to 167 centimeters in height and had a defect in his left eye. Going by this evidence, the police made a wrongful arrest of a local sex offender, Pedro Pablo, but they were forced to release him when more bodies kept popping up while he was in jail. With the receipt the police retrieved from the field, they were able to track down Luis's girlfriend, who told the authorities she had not seen Luis in months. She, however, gave police a suitcase full of Luis's belongings, and inside, the police found the numerous disguises that he used to lure children, as well as some pictures of young boys and a detailed ledger of his murders. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Luis was arrested on the 22nd of April, 1999, on an unrelated case of attempted rape of a 12-year-old boy. A 16-year-old boy had been present at the time when Luis attempted to take the little boy. The teenager would go on to alert the police, who arrested him immediately. Confession and Sentencing Upon his arrest, it was discovered that the man in jail was, in fact, the dreaded killer nicknamed La Bestia, the Beast, a man that was wanted in all of Colombia. Luis initially denied any involvement in the mass killings, even going as far as denying the attempted rape which he was arrested for. In the end, after he was found guilty, Luis was sentenced to 1,853 years in a maximum security prison, the highest prison sentence in Colombian history. But Colombian law only permits the highest prison sentence to be 40 years, which helped lessen Luis's prison sentence. And because he was very cooperative with the authorities in terms of the location of the grave sites of his victims, his sentence was further reduced to 22 years. Why? He is currently held at a maximum security prison where he is held separately from the rest of the inmates, which makes a lot of sense because otherwise the other inmates would possibly kill him for his crimes against possibly. the children. They Judging would. from the numbers, Luis should be eligible for parole sometime this year, but the controversy surrounding his case has yet to fade. Many believe Luis should have gotten a death sentence or at least life imprisonment, and not a reduced sentence with the possibility of a monster like him being released back into society.
I didn't know what I was getting myself into. That was a hard watch. I don't know anybody that's been killed like that. I've, I've known people that have been killed, but like that, I don't know anybody, especially as kids or anything. Um, when I was younger, I used to think back when the Boston um, bombings happened, I was just like, yeah, people need to be sentenced to death. And being in prison for life is a lot worse because people, like you want to die, basically you have that outlook like, all right, I'm going to be in here for a while, but I'm going to die. But obviously being in a max prison, you know what, what is it like one hour a day free for life? That's way worse. But this guy is about to be, I cannot believe that was, I don't get this law what happened with Columbia. I cannot believe they did that. I know Columbia is like, I think it's in the top 20 of the most, uh, dangerous countries I think if I'm right I think I read that um I know child trafficking is big out there let me know how you guys feel about that um if you guys watched all of it and you got to this thank you for getting here I really appreciate it um let me know how you guys feel about all that Thank you.